This is Aisle 42. Okay, everyone, buckle up. I sat down with Ben Mand from Harmless Harvest. They're the ones who make the coconut water that even coconut water haters love, like me. Yeah, totally. Ben is a smart, passionate, and driven food executive that gives a damn about the future of food. In this episode, you'll learn how his team is committed to sourcing organic ingredients and regenerative farming practices to create better tasting, functional plant-based beverages and yogurts. Ben pulls back the curtain of coconut farming and how they're using upcycling to drive product innovation. And we also talk about their path towards sustainable packaging and their zero waste initiative. So many good things. Oh, and Ben also gives us a sneak peek of a new beverage they're making that will be the first of its kind in the world. All right, all right, that's enough buildup. It's a packed episode, let's get to it. Here's my conversation with Ben Mann from Harmless Harvest. All right, Ben, we're here. Thanks so much for doing this. Uh, Thanks for having me. So I'm going to kick things off. This is a bit of an opener to get things going. Imagine the future. If you were to imagine the perfect grocery store of the future, what would it look like? Oh, the perfect grocery store. Well, it would certainly have a lot more fresh foods than we typically have right now or more minimally processed uh, foods. That certainly would be something that I would look for. I think one of the things I struggle with, I struggle with a few things, I guess. One is just all the packaging and how do we reimagine packaging such that there's more that we know is absolutely recycled and or returned and reused certainly is uh, kind of the world that I I would love to live in and having some consistency across because I don't always shop at the same place. So, you know, if you have to return, you know, there are some formats out there where you, there are containers that you use and then you return to that store. So there are very few of them, but there are some of those ideas. But I'd like to take that container and sometimes go to a different store or, you know, in, in, in the various different places. So I think, you know, definitely stuff along those lines. And then, Just all the waste, Uh, there still is a lot of waste in our system. And so how do you, is there a way for things to be a little more customized or, you know, for people, you know, with smaller households, bigger households, and certainly encourage use of leftovers and things like that. So I always think back, my wife and I used to do these recipes that was like on a one night, and we would do this on a Sunday, you make, I don't know, I'm going to make it up like this pork tenderloin or whatever it may be. And then you you eat that one night. And then the next day you make something else with some of the leftovers. And then the next day you make something different with the rest of the leftovers. And so it becomes three very different meals, but you're kind of using some of the stuff you made the first day and then adding in some other fresh ingredients or whatever. So just this idea of how do you find a way to waste less? So there's certainly good recipes or good kind of approaches that you can send home with people that has that you know encourages use of of leftovers and and just even the drippings or you know what you know the broth that you get from you know whether it's a chicken that you roast or whatever that's you know typically i would make that into a soup then i love it less plastic less food waste sounds like a great uh, great experience all right so for those that don't know you and your company well what kind of products does harmless harvest make uh, and what's your personal favorite that's what's most interesting to me what's your favorite product that you guys make Goodness, the favorites are is going to be the toughest one because I feel like I have it's hard to pick among the children, right? It's all your fault. It's all your fault. Yes. So we're a coconut based uh, business. So we were uh, originally founded with this this notion of constructive capitalism, the idea that everybody should benefit, not just financial investors. So starting with the farmers, going through the supply chain and the factory workers and everybody all the way to the shelf should benefit from this product. So constructive capitalism is how we are founded. So for me and for the business, it's a very principles approach to to running a business. And we believe, you know, we very much invest in in aspects that drive both people, planet, and then obviously great products. We're most well known for our coconut water. Uh, that's what originally put us on the map. And you know, when I joined five and a half years ago, that's basically all we produced was uh, you know four sizes of coconut water. Today we do all sorts of different products. So one of the things that struck me early on was we make an amazing coconut water, but like we buy the most expensive coconut in the world and we only use the water out of it. We've that's like A, not harmless, and B, 
not very fin- financially smart. So we got to use this entire coconut. So we developed a line of yogurts. So we scoop the coconut meat and we puree the fresh coconut meat with a little bit of water, tapioca, starch, um, and cultures. And that's it. That's the plain. And then you add strawberry puree for strawberry, et cetera. You get the idea. So these great yogurts, we do drinkable yogurts. We do coconut water with pulp. We do smoothies, which is coconut water and the coconut meat just pureed together. And you get a plain, but then we do chocolate, which is just cocoa and sea salts to you name it. So all sorts of amazing products. Now- I'm not letting you off the hook. What's your favorite? I know, (laughs) the favorite, the favorite. Well- I have one current favorite and then a new one that's coming. So I'll I'll shed a little light on something that's coming down the pipeline. But I would say my current favorite would have to be, oh, it's so tough. I'd say the the plain yogurt. I love our plain yogurt. Just It's so simple. It's just using something that was once thrown away and is now recycled into a coconut yogurt. So you had hinted at maybe there's something new coming that's getting you pretty excited. What, what are you able to share with us? Give us the scoop. Yeah, I would say my new favorite is uh, sparkling coconut water. So just like some people like with pulp and without pulp, I, I tend to prefer with pulp personally. There are also people who like still versus sparkling water or that kind of different texture. And this is technically very challenging for us to do, but we have uh, a bunch of new equipment on their way over. Actually, some of it's coming from France uh, to our factory in Thailand. And we will be able to have the ability to do a cold filter coconut water that is sparkling. So for anybody who's technically adept in food processing and whatnot, doing a cold filtered uh, sparkling beverage is extremely difficult. Um, In fact, we believe we'll be the first cold filtered uh, sparkling coconut water or, or beverage in the world. So pretty exciting, but it's really nice. So it's just, you know, you still get that great coconut uh, water flavor and the electrolytes, but it's sparkling. And so it's just, uh, for me, just a, a little, like a little more refreshing. I don't know. There's something about sparkling carbonated beverages that I, I personally enjoy. And we showed it at uh, Natural Products Expo East here in the US in Philadelphia in September and got tons of of very uh, positive feedback. People really, really loving it. Uh, So we're pretty excited about that. And that comes, we should have it here in the US for start of ship uh, to customers in February, March, somewhere in that timeframe. Very cool. Coconut water is a bit of a polarizing product. And personally, um, the first few attempts I made at at that type of product, I really disliked it. And I tried yours about a year and a half ago for the first time. And when I was traveling, I was just like, man, this is this is not the coconut waters of the past <laughs> that I've had before. So it's uh, the fact that you're adding bubbles. I mean, from France, I mean, the, the machinery from France, that's where bubbles are birthed, yeah. aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So yeah, no, we're really excited about it. It's, uh, you know, we often have people say like, oh, I don't like coconut water. And then they try our coconut water. They're like, oh my God, this is what coconut water is supposed to taste like. It's really good. And then we still have some people, in fact, I do know, I'm not going to name this buyer of a uh, customer that we have who has, you know, admits off the record she's like you know i don't like coconut water all that much even yours it's just not my thing my flavor but she loves the sparkling she's like there's just that added kind of refreshing and bubbles and whatnot and suddenly she's like now i i love coconut water so that's part of the power is also you know it's not only giving new occasions but with these types of innovation you bring in new consumers into the fold and so i'm pleased to say that uh, you know this this buyer uh, it finally likes one of our coconut waters which is uh, an exciting milestone that's good yeah well done well done team let's go back to these coconuts now you mentioned hand scooping that sounds nice and artisanal and all but you guys make a lot of product like how do you scale a hand scooping coconut meat project. That sounds really overwhelming. It is. It's a lot. I mean, we've looked at so many different ways to automate it. We still have some ideas that we're kind of, we're we're exploring, but we have not found a good way to automate it. You literally have to hand scoop it. And yes, we process millions of coconuts. So that does mean millions of coconuts getting scooped. We've gotten far more efficient at it. It's certainly, it's a whole kind of setup and in a lot of labor and a lot of space, but we've gotten really efficient in just how we, how we flow the coconuts, how we cut the coconuts, what we scoop, don't scoop. 
And there are different grades of what we'd say coconut meat. So some that is very thin, others that gets a little thicker. They lend themselves to different products. So it even gets more complicated in the grading system internally and what we process into puree and what we process into the little dices that you get in your uh, coconut water with pulp. So lots of different ways we use the coconut meat. And uh, it is a very difficult thing to scale, but we have lots of people who are scooping and we just keep expanding that. It's amazing. So let's stick with the team for a second here. You've got a team in the U.S., but you have a team abroad too. And I want to sort of piggyback off that with, you have a certification that's called Fair for Life. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about like, what does that mean? And how does it build into and invest into the Harmless Harvest community and what you guys are building? Yeah. So Fair for Life, it's similar to many people are asking, like, is is that kind of like fair trade? And to some degree it is. So fair trade is really just at the source and, and that's the same for us. So it's making sure that you're paying a fair price and that you're treating people humanely and appropriately. But fair for life goes all the way through the chain. So it's not only the farmers, but then the factory and every partner we're working with has to be fair for life certified or they themselves fair trade. And so it goes all the way through the chain of custody of making sure that everything's fair for life. And so practically speaking, what it means for us is a number one, we do have a price floor for coconuts. And that is uh, calculated by an outside firm, you know, NGO that uh, worked uh, with Fair for Life to determine what is the, the a minimal wage for farmers um, when, in, when you're buying the coconuts. So one, there's that. Second is for us, we on top of that set aside money for every coconut we buy. And then the local community, they elect their own board and then they determine how they spend their, their dollars. And so we don't sit on that board. That is their, you know, those are their funds to determine how they use. And, and they're used from anything from like health and wellness checkups, you know, clean water. Uh, in fact, I, I was looking at the list of things that they're investing in right now, um, some STEM, you know, so for the schools, we actually separately also donate laptops and things like that. So as we use them and at some point, let's say they're not uh, as you know fast and whatever, but they're certainly perfectly fine for school settings where they don't have any computers, but STEM projects um, and they had some more uh, health and wellness checkups. They've actually, as we are transitioning to regenerative organic, uh, they're starting to see really the benefits because we subsidize the compost and we're doing beekeeping and whatnot. They themselves have chosen actually to invest some of their dollars into and, and match some of the stuff that we're doing from a regenerative organic, which to me is really powerful because that's their choice to spend dollars there. And it be really importantly, demonstrates that they're seeing benefits uh, from separately the investments that we're doing from a regenerative organic standpoint. So those are some of the things that you do from a, from a fair for life. Yeah. So actually let's, that regenerative piece, you know, in the media, consumers are hearing more about it, but in the grocery stores, uh, on the shelves, there's not as many products or brands that are really pushing into that. You guys are leaning hard into it. Why is sourcing certified regenerative organic coconuts so difficult? It takes a long time. So uh, I made the decision actually over five years ago now to start the transition to regenerative organic. And so we as leaders make, you know, short-term and long-term decisions. This was one that we knew would be important in the long term. And I'm happy that we ultimately made that decision uh, to move and transition to regenerative organic. It takes quite a while. So you also have to convince because we don't own the farms ourselves. So we work with farmers, but we have to compel them and incentivize them to make the transition to regenerative organic. And so there have been practice, you know, farming practices for years and years. And one of the things that we've had to overcome is as we do intercropping. So let's say we do mangoes or pineapple or whatever it may be kind of interspersed or coffee is another one we're doing. And we're looking at vanilla. There's a number of ones that we're testing in various different farms to ultimately find what is the crop that seems to make most sense. You know, farmers at first and still a lot of farmers worry about competition. They feel that they're going to get less yield on the coconuts versus when you're picking nitrogen fixing cover crops, you're actually there's a symbiotic relationship with the different types of plants as as you can choose them. And so overcoming that idea that you're going to compromise your current yields has been something that has has taken a bit of time. You know, bees make sense. They intuitively, they pollinate and stuff like that. So they kind of get that. Uh, So the beekeeping is a little little bit easier. Uh, We have some nitrogen, light nitrogen uh, fixing cover crops. 
And those have been, at first, were a little bit difficult, but now they're seeing the benefit of it because on a whole bunch of levels. One is just practically speaking, it keeps the weeds at bay. So they don't have to weed. So they actually lowers their costs. And uh, because there are canals in between each of these, you know, the, the row of coconuts, you have less um, erosion. So they don't have to dredge as often. So again, it's lowering costs. And then we're seeing, we're going through a really bad drought right now. We see benefits for, in moisture levels. So when you have the cover crop, it holds the moisture better in the soil versus it drying up and, and evaporating. So we're seeing better moisture levels and we're seeing better soil health, both of which we're now starting to see, uh, start to translate into better yields on the farm. So it's in the early days, it's about proving. So we started with 13 farms. You prove out these things and you see those benefits. And then they talk to other farmers and other farmers come and visit their farms. And so that's how we've been, now that you get some good experience and some good you know, learnings, some of the things we've changed along the way, but then now they start, they're more willing to uh, expand beyond that. And so the reason it's so hard is it takes a long time. And I have 28 agronomists working that are on staff, right? So you have to have all, a team of people going and visiting regularly with the farmers and they're in the farms. I'm teaching them these principles, showing them how it really works. So it's a, it's a major investment, both in time and resources. But eventually, you know, we did this not only for the environment, but this is just, you know, any business is like, we also think it makes good business sense, right? You know, like if you can combat climate change and do right by the environment and it gives you better yields, that's great for farmers. One of our goals is that uh, we need to raise their incomes by at least 10%. That's part of our, our transition to regenerative is making sure that we're also increasing their incomes. But it also has is, you know, long term, we think will be better yields for us. And so it benefits them, benefits the environment and benefits us. That's amazing. And when you're talking about farmers, you're talking mostly about Thailand, I believe, correct? Yep. And you took your US team to Thailand recently to experience this and to like in full transparency see and just connect with that whole side of the business what was that what was that journey like with your team it was uh, amazing i mean in the sense that you know one of the things that separates harmless harvest from other brands is Oftentimes there's just this 2% for, and, the, and it's just kind of at the end of the year, you write a check for, and it goes to some organization. And that is valuable and that is good. That is doing good. But it's a, a very transactional kind of approach. It's not uh, a very hands-on experience. And for us, you know, one of the things that sets us apart is like, we just don't write a check to somebody. We actually are very hands-on and do it ourselves as well. So, and one of the things we pride ourselves on is like everybody, like, we have various projects that we're working on and all functions across the organization can participate in driving those projects. And so we all own, you know, being a responsible business and we all have to take part in helping drive projects to the finish line and, and make a positive impact. So I think that hands-on approach is really important. And what better way to understand it is like go there and actually see firsthand and go into the farms and help plant cover crops and, and uh, things like that. So certainly, you know, people had to get their hands dirty and, and get out there and do a little bit of work. But our local team did really good kind of demonstrations on just what does soil look like that's not been in a regenerative farm? And what does it look like you know, after several years of regenerative and just a cross-section of that soil, just the visual differences when you pour water on them, like their ability to absorb and, and handle moisture. Anybody who you know, studies this type of stuff starts to see a really dramatic difference. The beekeeping and, and just the honeys and, and the honey that you know the farmers have and being able to try that honey is pretty compelling. So seeing it all firsthand and how it actually works, A, is rewarding because you work for a company that stands for something and it's good to see like what it actually looks like in practice. But then the salesperson who goes back and is now meeting with a customer really understands what is going on. Like, what does it mean to be regenerative organic? Or what does it mean to use recycled PET in your bottles? And what does that look like? And the visual difference between the two. So that is, I would say, just a bit of a really powerful uh, experience for them. But marketers and how you, the language you use and things like that are also important. Yeah. And we're seeing, especially in the UK, some upcoming legislation that's going to change the way that companies are talking about some of these things and their impact on the climate or how they talk about their efforts with the climate to make sure that it's uh, legitimate and it's transparent. Uh, so there's a, you know, there's, 
the global movement, it's it's changing for sure. You mentioned the bottles that you guys are using, the 100% recycled plastic. You know, we're talking about the future of the grocery store and looking at all the plastic that's everywhere. Um, what's been the journey like on your side around sort of changing and, and making innovations on the packaging side? Because that is a, that's a difficult part of the business, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, packaging, and it's something I talked about right in the upfront is something that's important in that, you know, how do you find the package that is most environmentally friendly? And unfortunately, there's a lot of just misinformation out in the marketplace on like, what is the right, you know, the best packaging. And and then there's just also a lot of packaging that's a little misleading, right? It looks like paper, you know, it's, let's say it's using paper and people think it's compostable, but then they don't realize it's lined with plastic. And so they're putting in the compost bin, but actually, and then it gets composted, but it's actually full of plastic as well. So it's really a helping consumers understand, you know, what is their packaging, how to recycle, what's not recyclable, what is, you know, the best impact. And I think we often think of like, what is the best packaging based on how it's recycled or if it's recyclable or not. And unfortunately, there's two separate things that you have to really think through. There is what vessel you know for, of packaging is most beneficial from a greenhouse gas standpoint? What is you know it, it contributing to climate change? And they're each a little bit different in that regard. And then there's what is then contributing to waste, right? So what is being recycled or not recycled? And so, you know, when you think about glass and aluminum and things like that, they are recycled um, more readily than most other package types. And so I think consumers just kind of think, well, that that is then the best package. But the reality is from a greenhouse gas contribution standpoint, either through because they're so heavy in logistics uh, costs or the cost to actually extract from the earth and or recycle those materials, they use a lot of energy in that regard. So aluminum and glass start to don't compare well to, let's say, paper or plastic from a greenhouse gas standpoint, but then there's the, how do they get recycled? And so, you know, for us, when we looked at packaging, when I took over the company, we were using virgin plastic. And I felt that was an issue. And we started this whole packaging project to understand like, what is the best package. And at first I was like, oh, we got to do glass or we got to do aluminum or something like that. And I quickly realized as we met with experts that that actually wasn't the best choice from a greenhouse gas standpoint. And, you know, just long story made very short, started to realize that plastic was better in that regard. I felt we should do then plant-based plastic, uh, like a bioplastic that's compostable. It takes quite a while for them to compost. The real issue there that I learned that I was very you know sad to learn was you can't tell really the difference between PET. So it really just ends up in the plastic recycling stream and it's not recyclable and it pollutes the plastic recycling stream. And so then that plastic is not able to be recycled. And so what I started to realize is like, when you do that, you, it ends up in the wrong place and now you actually make things worse. And so what I ultimately realized was for now, we need to go to 100% recycled PT. So it's really good from a greenhouse gas standpoint, but if we're buying recycled plastic, we're solving the main issue with plastic is that it's not recycled to, to the same degree. But if we buy recycled plastic, we are doing our part to reuse and make sure that there's no virgin plastic. That all said, we're still working on I have this pipe dream. My, my, my team thinks I'm crazy, but there is a company out there that's able to take like plant materials like coconut husk and create a paper out of it where you can then create ideally corrugate out of it. So I like the idea of being able to make use our husks to, you know, make the corrugate to ship our product. That is a ways off, as my team will remind me. But um, when I talk about it enough, it starts to, you know, make things uh, closer to a reality because it pushes pushes the team. So we're certainly looking at things like that. Even the bottles are plant based materials that you can uh, you can use. We are looking at uh, anything we possibly can to try and find the the most environmentally preferred packaging option. I love it. That's so great. Yeah, it's good to dream, right? It's good to set the standard and, and work towards something and to do the hard work. And the more food brands that, you know, we talk about it on the business side, the food, you know, the value chain from the beginning to the end, that's where sustainability in food and in beverage is really going to make a difference when all of those things are considered. So it's pretty, uh, it's pretty great to hear everything that you're doing. Where can people find your products and learn more about Harmless Harvest? 
I would say we're all over the place. You know, typically you can, you know, any natural organic store in your market, you know, typically if it doesn't have it yet, we'll have it soon. So typically that's, you know, some of the first places. And then, you know, most major urban areas. So if you're Canada or the US, you know, the major cities typically and and those grocery stores will have it. You know, we do rotations at Costco in North America. So in some regions you might find harmless at Costco. And then, you know, certainly what we're working a lot on right now is what we call away from home channel. So beyond the typical grocery store or the typical natural uh, co-op that you may visit or the mass uh, retailers that you might visit, how do you get into airports and and gas stations and more kind of the up and down the street? Of, you know, we call it away from home consumption, and so that's probably an area that you know we still have some opportunity on you know across the board, but a big focus of ours now. That's awesome. Good deal. Well, thanks for doing this. Love the brand. Love the product. The innovation of sparkling is. I can't wait to try it. I can't yeah. believe I missed my chance at Philadelphia. I uh, I can't wait to try it. That's awesome. Yeah, no, sparkling, I'm very excited about. So you'll have to tell me what you think once you try it. Awesome. Good deal. Thanks a lot for doing this, Ben. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I I appreciate it too. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening. What did I tell you? Ben is the real deal, and his team is making the future a better place through food. The next time you're shopping online or at the grocery store or on the go, grab a harmless harvest beverage and be sure to follow them on social. Before you jump to the next episode or turn your attention somewhere else, could you do me this one favor and do the podcast love thing? Hit the like button or the follow button or the subscribe button or whatever button your audio app has for you. And if you'd be so kind as to offer up a rating or a review, I'd be really, really happy. And if entering for a chance to win the monthly prize of a $250 grocery gift card interests you, go to aisle42podcast.com. There it is. I'm done. I'm out of here. I'll see you in the future.